Guess who's happy? It is September 20th, 2021, and you are listening to episode 37 of the Candid Clarinetist podcast. What's going on, everybody? Sam Rothstein here, acting principal clarinetist of the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra and host of the Candid Clarinetist podcast. Thanks so much to everyone who participated in our 1,000 Instagram follower giveaway. I was so thrilled to reach that milestone, and congratulations to all of our winners. An easy way to help support the Candid Clarinetist and all of our content is to follow us on social media. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Instagram at the Candid Clarinetist. Also, please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, as well as give us a rating on iTunes and subscribe to us on your favorite podcasting platform. On this episode of the podcast, I am joined by Kelly Reardon, who is a clarinet teacher and coach. Kelly has developed a program to train other musicians on how to build a private teaching studio, and I thought it would be valuable to have her on to talk about what she does. Before we get started, if you have any questions for Kelly or are interested in the services she provides, you can contact her at kellyreardon.com. Welcome to the podcast, Kelly. Thank you so much, Sam. I really appreciate it. Of course. So can you briefly describe your career and sort of how you've wound your way to where you are now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I obviously, like most of us, lifelong musician. I started music when I was very young at, I think, age four or five. Somewhere in there was my first piano lesson. Um, but I was lucky enough to study at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee for my undergrad with Todd Levy, who's the principal clarinetist for the Milwaukee Symphony, of course. Uh, after that, found my way down to University of Georgia, where I studied with Dr. David McClellan for two years for my master's program. And then a few months before COVID, found my way back to the Milwaukee area. I live about a half hour, 45 minutes outside of the city. Uh, my parents are a little bit further west, so it was nice to come back after graduation because it had been, been a little wild. The South was good, but I missed snow, sort of. You're the only one. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you say that, and then the first time it snows in Georgia, and then everything shuts down because they don't yes. have salt trucks. Oh yeah, Changes I lived in your mind really quick. <laughs> yeah, I lived in Virginia and it snowed every year there, but every time it snowed, it just like completely. Yeah, it was like a like, shock. Yeah, yeah so <laughs> I think our county had one salt truck that they had bought like a year or two before we moved down there, so it was it's not going to be enough. Yeah, 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 it's not <laughs> not the right system, but that's all right. Um, but yeah, so when I came back, started teaching. That was the goal. I didn't want to take a job elsewhere, so I started my own studio. And shortly after the pandemic hit, and other people needed help, so here we are. <laughs> yeah. So, so you started this, um, this program coaching mentorship program. Um, and I, I read the testimonials on your website and it's fantastic. I mean, everyone had Thank such you. great things to say, such great things to say. Um, what sort of got you, uh, it, was it your own success that drove you to start this program? That's, that's a phenomenal question. Um, I, when I started my studio, in about three months, I grew up from zero to 40 students. Wow. You know, I just relocated. I didn't have anyone in the area at that time. Where I ended up settling is in between where I grew up and then the city of Milwaukee. So all the contacts that I have are just far enough away that a beginning clarinet student is not going to travel, you know, a half hour, 45 minutes for a lesson. So I had to work really, really hard on building new connections and networking and creating an environment that was successful for myself. And when everything closed a few months later and you know, March, 2020, we all had to move online. My students came with me. I didn't really give them a choice to be totally clear. Yeah. I just told them you already paid me for the month and this is what we're doing. And if you absolutely hate it, then we'll reevaluate later, but we're trying this for the next few weeks. And it worked really well. Everyone stayed all 40 of my kiddos, a couple adults to moved online and it was great. Um, a couple of weeks in, I was realizing that I was not, I was not in great company in that boat. Most people were struggling. They gave the option to go online. Their studio was smaller. Uh, they had been performing and obviously that wasn't an option anymore. So they wanted to be at that time transitioning into more of a teaching career. So I just started helping wherever I could taking all the data that I had logged to build my own studio and applying it to theirs and 
it was fantastic. I saw a lot of great successes. It was about four or five months before someone sat me down and said, you're spending 30 to 40 hours a week on Zoom with other teachers helping them. I think you have a business and you might want to start charging for it. Yeah. Um, so it kind of fell into my lap and I've really been grateful because I love what I do, but I love being able to impact more students than just my own. So a brief follow-up question to that. Did yeah. you, did someone like see how quickly you kind of did this and was like, how did you, and, and then asked you how you did it? Or was it like you, you were just friends with people and. Yeah. The first, the first few people that I helped were local colleagues that okay. were in particular really uncomfortable teaching online. So I was just helping to, to coach them on how to use zoom and the settings that you need and, um, how to make sure that music was accessible on your screen. So you could screen share and show students and follow along. And just some really, from my perspective at that time, really basic tech skills that other people maybe just weren't as familiar with. And then it evolved into, okay, now I can use zoom. How do I find more students on zoom? And I, I still was using the same organic methods that I used to build my own studio on theirs. And it grew really fast. I had a percussion a percussion studio that I was working with that grew to 65 students in the middle of the pandemic online. And he was one of those first few people I was working with. Um, what ended up happening though, a few months later, I actually had this idea to run an AP music theory course. That was really my, in my mind, that was my solution to the pandemic is I got this knowledge. A lot of the schools in my area aren't able to offer AP music theory this year. I could do this on zoom. Mm -hmm. So I sat down and talked to a friend of ours who is, does a little bit more business coaching and consulting for larger businesses. He's not really focused in the arts and kind of ran the idea by him. So that's a great idea, but tell me about this other thing that you're doing. I was like, what other thing that you're doing? He's like, well, you know, you kind of mentioned that you've been helping other people online and that's why you're interested in teaching more online. I was like, yeah, yeah, I am. He goes, do you really want to teach an AV music theory course or do you like what you're doing already? I was like, well, I like what I'm doing, but you know, I don't know that I can make a lot of money doing it. And this AV music theory course means I get to work with more students. And he kind of challenged me and pushed me to refocus a little bit and just see what I could actually come up with as a formalized program mm -hmm. instead of just hopping on Zoom calls when people were available. Yeah. And, uh, so we did and it took on a life of its own. I've got right now I'm working with about 25 active clients. Oh my gosh. Well, good for you. I just, it, it's, that's amazing. You. And it seems like it happened super fast. Like you just, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, it's, overwhelmingly so <laughs> yeah, right. It's like all of a sudden you build it and then you have, you know, there's 25 people that, that you're yeah. helping on a weekly basis. Uh, that's people incredible. People are calling you that you've never met before and it's, yeah wild it's great well, I, but it's i mean wild. good for you that's that's just that's awesome i mean Thank that's what you. we all kind of dream of is just you know creating this thing that that other people want to consume you know that's part of the reason why i started doing what i do uh yeah. and i didn't have nearly the success that you've had apparently so <laughs> um so congratulations uh, on that oh thank you um and it seems like you you know so you moved back to milwaukee <laughs> um and, and was it, was the sole goal, it's just like you wanted to teach privately. Like that, that was what you wanted to do with your degree. And yeah, at that time, so a little bit of background, when I was in high school, I worked as an intern for a local conservatory and there was a music store in the front. So I was mostly working for the music store, but part of what I got to do was that when people would call and ask for recommendation for lessons, I got to learn a bit, little bit of that process and help them kind of get registered and get in contact. But all the teachers were independent contractors. So I was really just that initial starting point. And then I would help them, you know, get referrals mm -hmm. into the, into the studios. So I'd been around teaching and fresh out of school to me, it was, really clear in my mind that that was the fastest way for me to have a livable income. Yeah. And, you know, taking auditions, obviously there's so many factors and somewhere in my grad program, I started realizing that it's not really where I wanted to invest my time. Um, it's exciting to me. I love playing, but I really love playing chamber music mm -hmm. <laughs> and that takes a little bit more self-funding to get going than, you know, just taking auditions. And so I wanted to have something that would pay the bills so I could sustain this dream of mine. And I have a trio that I perform with out of Athens, Georgia that, you know, 
non-COVID time as we do travel and perform together. So I wanted to have funding for that. I knew what I could make. I did the math on what people in my area had previously been charging from my recollection. Go, like, oh, I could make some decent money if I can fill the studio. Yeah, for sure. So I invested my time there. I knew I didn't want to take a job outside of music because the odds of you coming back into music after that are a lot lower. So that was my big push. That's where I wanted to be. Awesome. Um, so you mentioned uh, eventually you sort of formalized this coaching mm -hmm. uh, business. About how long after you sort of started the initial conversations with people and helping people out, did it become the formalized thing that it is today? Probably about four or five months. Because so, it would have so been March of last then. year. Yeah, it was about March of last year that I was starting, you know, right at the beginning of the pandemic, starting to help yeah. people. Okay. And it was, it was about a year ago now. Last September, I think, is when I actually sat down and wrote a plan <laughs> uh -huh. and tried to figure out what I was doing and what was working for people and, um, you know, put together a significant amount of resources and try to consolidate it all into one place instead of me just sending individual things in an email as I was talking to people and tried to actually create a, a structure that was duplicatable mm -hmm. for, for studios. And is your, is your program uh, pretty prescriptive or is it kind of like, it depends on, so, so for example, like I'm, I'm probably, mm -hmm. I probably would be a unique client to you because obviously I, you know, I had this job in the orchestra and it's not really you know, it, it's just kind of like a different, so, so mm -hmm. would my plan be a little bit different, for example, than, than someone, uh, you know, graduating from undergrad? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing is when we're getting started, if you are looking for 10 hours a week or less of teaching, it doesn't need to be a significant push. So most of the, the studios that I'm working with are wanting to be at that like 15 to 30 hour a week mark where teaching would be their main income. I have a few exceptions to that, of course, but those exceptions are usually people like, I've got a couple clients out in LA or in New York that are vocal coaches that are charging 150 to $200 an hour. They only need 10 hours right. a week of work, so that's what they're gonna do. But we're also finding a higher level of clientele for them. So they're not looking at you know eight to 10 year old beginners. They're looking at students who are ages 14 and up and are looking to be in the industry and want work and want to take this as a professional career. So where we spend our time is a little bit different. It's all the same strategies. We're just okay. targeting a slightly different group of people. But what we want to do is make sure that from the get, we really understand what the goals are and who you want to be working with. So it okay. is, it is specific to each person's goals. Um, for example, I, I also work with multi-teacher studios or music schools. Their goals are very different because we're adding, you know, students for many instruments and many different skills and levels. Can, can you explain um, what that is just, just for my own? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So a multi-teacher studio would be typically a studio that had an individual teacher. Their studio blew up and had a lot of success. And so they started hiring. And they're usually comprised of other independent contractors. And then that key person at the, at the head of the multi-teacher studio is just kind of delegating leads out to, out to individual teachers, um, versus a school, which is a little bit more of a conservatory style where they have an office and they're taking in leads and doing the marketing and then dispersing those to employees. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, well, that's terrific. Cause, cause you know, obviously it's not, you know, it's like with anything else, like one size doesn't fit all. So mm -hmm. for example, just to tell my story and how unsuccessful I was and why you should hire <laughs> Kelly and not talk to me about it. Um, so at the start of the pandemic, I was, I was thinking, I was like, well, maybe I can, you know, in the fall, I could try to recruit some students or whatever. And mm -hmm. like my strategy, and you're probably going to roll your eyes. was, I was emailing like high school band directors. I was like, does anybody want to take you know, students or whatever. And I got a couple of like leads mm -hmm. on it, but it, but it wasn't like this thing. And I think part of the reason is I just wasn't targeting the right people because the people that would want to mm -hmm. take lessons with me and would get value out of me, probably not like, you know, high school freshmen, you know? Right. <laughs> so, right. Um, Unless they're incredibly competitive high school freshmen. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, it, and it's not like I can't teach them or I can't, but you know, the, they wouldn't want to pay me what I would want to charge, right. you, you know, like it's just, Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I wouldn't give them, they wouldn't get out of what they would pay me. 
if right. you, to, for a lesson. Right. Um, so as far as age ranges go, um, do you feel that it's easier to recruit a certain age level of student? Like, do you find that the most fertile ground being like beginners or people that are into it a little bit more? Yeah. Or... You know, there are a million trillion four to seven year old beginner piano students. They're everywhere. Yes. <laughs> so it's as like, far as like, I'm a, a, I'm a recovering gonna, pianist when yeah. I was four years old, <laughs> as far as a student that's going to grow the fastest, that's going to be the one that, you know, I can take from and, and do take from zero to 40 in two to three months. Right. That's right. very easy for us to do because they're everywhere. They're looking and, most, you know, when we're talking about uh, reaching out to schools, for example, elementary school music teachers are way more likely to answer your email than a high school band director because they just get fewer of those emails. Um, when we look at more advanced students, it's not that they're harder to find. It's just that they are typically already working with someone. If they're advanced, they have a teacher. Right. So there's two, two parts here. One, when we're looking for advanced students, a really great thing for us to do is actually to network with the teachers they might already be working with. When I was in high school, my junior year of high school, my teacher who I'd been with for eight years, who phenomenal player, incredible teacher had gotten me from eight year old Kelly, whose fingers could not even reach all of the keys on the clarinet, but was persistent that this is what she wanted to be playing mm -hmm. to, you know, winning competitions. And I was principal for my orchestras and the youth orchestra. And I you know, was getting solos at school and things were going really well. I was in state honors, all that great stuff. She sat me down at the end of my junior year and said, I'm no longer the teacher for you. That's, that's and, very humble of her because that's often oh, not very. the case. Yeah. Yes. But she knew that with what I wanted to do and that I wanted to have a career in music, the person she recommended was Professor Levy at UW Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And so I reached out to him and had a trial lesson and we went down that path and I ended up working with him my senior year of high school, loved it, stayed for my undergrad because it was a great experience. But I would not have taken that leap on my own. I don't think I would have felt confident enough to just reach out to him without someone telling me this is, this is the next step for you. So for a lot of advanced teachers, it's finding the teachers that are teaching the beginner to intermediate and even into a little bit of advanced, but are going to, going to need to pass students off at some point. For example, I have taught, I, I don't teach any piano students currently now, but when I was first starting my studio, I did take on some beginner piano students. I had to give them off to another teacher once they hit a certain level. So I had a list of who I would hand them off to. And those people didn't take beginners. They needed someone like me to prepare them for that studio. And I knew what they were looking for and I knew what to prep them for and, and hand them off. So that's a big area too. And then of course, high school band directors are great, but you know, th they get a million of those emails. Is anyone looking for lessons? You're right. one of 57. They got that week. Yeah. And do you find that like, okay, so just, I mean, I guess you teach on online now, mm -hmm. but, um, do you have certain schools that you teach out of? So for example, like you're the clarinet mm -hmm. teacher at, uh, you know, X and Y high school. So I actually rent a commercial space Okay. because I, when I was first teaching, when we first relocated, I was teaching at my one bedroom apartment and my poor neighbors were so incredibly patient, but that needed to change. Yeah. Um, so I rent in a commercial space nearby that actually has a lot of music teachers and they've got this great setup where the owners of the building are musicians and the rooms are sort of soundproofed and we can, you know, have our, have our own little spaces, but we can share a room. So if I'm not there five days a week, for example, another teacher can take on part of that lease and we can share, share that space. Um, so I am not appointed at any schools in particular right now. What I am, I am appointed at the Waukesha County Conservatory. That's one of the, the areas that I, I teach in. And that's actually that commercial space. It's all independent sure. teachers. They call it a conservatory. It's not a traditional conservatory structure. Um, the other advantage of being an independent teacher and not being a teacher for a school is I set my own rates. I set my own schedule. And when I need to move things around, I move things around. If you're working for a, a music school or if you're working at a high school where the band boosters, for example, are paying you, you're incredibly limited on rate and there's overhead. So what would my the overhead, overhead is flat rate. 
the overhead for a, a band booster program, sometimes they take a cut out of that to feed the booster program unless they themselves are paying you. But then again, they've got your hourly rate set at what they can afford. Gotcha. The other overhead is that, and this isn't an overhead so much as a, as a limit, there's only so many clarinet students in that school district. And if they can't make it on Tuesday night, which is maybe the one night I'm at that school, now I don't get those students. They go elsewhere. Gotcha. You know, instead, I'm in a position where I can pull from all of the area schools. And I have students that are in, I think, five different school districts. Gotcha. So that's a big shift. Um, otherwise, overhead, you know, in, in, if you're not renting a space and you're working for another school, they're taking about 40 to 60 percent of a cut out of every lesson you teach. Wow. I guess I had a, a different experience, but it was probably because I went to the high school that I taught at. So I, I got a little bit of a, a better deal, I guess. Yep. Uh, this probably. was a while, this was ages ago, but <laughs> yeah. But yeah um, but that's great advice. I mean, that I remember I was limited by uh, scheduling because, you mm-hmm. know, the, whatever the, you know, they had testing that week, I can't teach or they have, right. uh, you know, they're on a band trip or whatever. Like I can't teach that week. So there were well, limiting when factors. When they're on winter break or summer break, you have to take off too. You can't. Yeah, exactly. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Really interesting. So you, you mentioned that obviously who you're targeting and who you're teaching is a, a big factor in how quickly you can build your private studio. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned beginner piano students, obviously very fertile. Um, what other aspects play a factor on how quickly, um, you know, so for example, let's take my, my case, I'm very introverted. I don't really, you know, would it take me longer than someone who's more comfortable sort of Mm. doing all these various things? You know, my, my perspective on this is it's more about the goal and why the goal is important to you. So the people that I I find that do best in my programs are people who, number one, not afraid to ask questions. If they don't understand something or if they need support, they, you know, I've got a Facebook group for my clients and they're posting there on a regular basis because they need help. If someone is hesitant to ask a question, then we can't progress them. Um, The second thing that really makes someone successful in building a studio is a time sensitive motivation. For a lot of musicians, it's like, oh, yeah, it'd be nice to teach on the side, which is true. I mean, that's a, that's a great way to, to look at it is this is something that is fulfilling that I'm doing outside of my other career and my other work. But where that can limit us is that it's something that we constantly put off. Like, ah, I'm not going to email the teachers today because, you know, maybe like, you know, September 20th isn't the exact right date. Maybe I should wait until September 27th and then we'll try that and we'll see if that's a, that's a better date. And it's like me with the exercise and diet. It's like, Oh, I'll do it tomorrow. Exactly. I'll start next week. Exactly. Oh, I'll start next week. It's totally fine. You know? <laughs> yeah. I, I was going to start my diet on Monday, but then someone brought donuts into work. So now I'm going <laughs> to Tuesday. I'll Tuesday it week. is. Yeah. Yep. Um, so it, it's the same thing where we just procrastinate on it. So having a time sensitive goal is really important. And if it's not something that you have a sense of urgency for necessarily, you can create a sense of urgency for yourself. Part of that is accountability, you know, working with another teacher or, or talking to someone like myself that can give you a push if it's something that you're really serious about. But the other part of that is identifying what it will do for you. And some of that's doing the math, you know, income is a, is a big factor for a lot of people. If they want to add five to $10,000 a month, then we're looking at starting immediately so that we can do that. Um, if it's like, oh, I just like, you know, a couple hundred extra dollars here and there, it's probably something that you're also going to take a little bit slower. Mm-hmm. Um, the final factor is someone who really enjoys teaching. If you're looking at teaching because you think it might be a good side hustle, but you're not actually sure if you're going to like it, please, I mean, try it first, of course, but people aren't motivated to do something if they're not actually sure it's going to be enjoyable. Mm-hmm. So I've, you know, I've talked to musicians that are excited about teaching because they're excited about the money. (laughs) But once we actually start to dive into what it's going to take to get there and the work that we have to put in, I frequently have people say, oh, this isn't actually something I think I want to do, the teaching in general. And that's totally fine. Like, I'm I'm happy to help you discover that too, so that, you you know, you and your student aren't (laughs) miserable in the future because you pushed yourself into something that wasn't really a passion of yours. That's totally fine. Yeah. Uh, All great advice. I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, So Mm -hmm. I I don't want to spill all your beans here, but do you you have any, you know, maybe just general tips on like just marketing, like how to market yourself, how to 
get, get your name out to potential students. Again, like, I, you know, people have to pay for this, so I'm not trying to, <laughs> oh, no, you're fine. I'm not trying you're to fine. give it out for free, but, but just maybe you're some totally general, fine. general comments that people are like, Oh, maybe I, I wouldn't have thought about that. Like your, yeah. your comment earlier was great about how you have, you need to get to know the teachers in the area. I think I thought that mm-hmm. was very valuable. Um, so any, there any more are, like, yeah, there, look, there are three big things that we need to have a full studio. And this is something that I talk about with every person I come into contact with. This is what you need, regardless of uh, if I'm a factor, if you're working with someone else that's in this space, um, you need a profitable lesson package, you need a predictable source of students and you need a repeatable enrollment <laughs> process. So I'll, I'll kind of dive into each of those a little bit. Okay. Profitable lesson package first, most teachers are undercharging. And it's a significant issue in our industry because it's undercutting everyone. Right now, industry standard in the U.S. is roughly a dollar a minute, which means that if you're out of undergrad and you you have a degree in music, you should be able to get $30 for 30 minutes or $60 for 60 minutes. Don't discount yourself less than an hourly rate. Your time is your time. And you need to hold yourself to that because the time that it took for you to develop the skill is unique to our industry. I remind people a lot that most of us started our instrument when we were in elementary school, maybe middle school, which means for most of our lives, <laughs> decades, we have been perfecting this. And there are no other careers that you have to have decided and mastered at a certain level by the age of 18 to even consider pursuing it in the future. People can decide at 18, 19, 20 years old to go be a doctor. And they get paid a lot of money. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it, it is an, an issue right now in our career field that people tend to undervalue themselves, either out of modesty. We, we all do you know, kind of grow up in this system where we're expecting each week to go into a lesson and be told what we're not great at yet. So getting that feedback on an ongoing basis, I think, diminishes our confidence a little bit in our value. Uh, the second big piece of this is that if if you were undercharging at the level of player that you are, it also lowers the payment for everyone else on the line. Yeah. And it's something that a lot of musicians struggle with is, you know, your rate should at least be a hundred dollars an hour. Absolutely not less than that. Uh Oh, (laughs) I should raise my rates. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, sure everybody. Right. <laughs> um, so that people that are living in a suburban area and have, you know, a, a, let's say an undergrad degree, they're charging 60 an hour. If you've got a master's, you should be in like that 70 to $80 an hour range. Of course, there are exceptions to this. If you live in a high cost of living area, you're in New York, you're in L.A., yeah. your rate should be higher. Right. right. If you're in rural Kentucky, then maybe your rate should be a little bit lower based on cost of living. We can adjust for that. But average is a dollar a minute. Um And then the other thing that we have to factor into that is it's not just the time spent in front of a student. Most of us are researching repertoire, finding additional resources, answering emails and text messages and phone calls outside, doing billing and invoicing. You have to have all of that factored into the time as well so that you're fairly compensated for all of it. The second thing that we need is that predictable source of students. I like to compare this to a glass of water in a well. So if you're out at the park on a hot sunny day, you have a glass of water. Once you drink it, it's gone. We've got three big options to refill it. We can spend money to buy a new one. We can spend time and energy hiking across the park to refill it. Or we could just say, ah, shucks, go home, give up, and try again tomorrow. If we're going to do this in studio building, the equivalent of spending money would be paid advertising. This would be you know, Google ads, Facebook ads, YouTube ads, uh, print ads, billboards, if you really want to get crazy with it. Paid advertising, I'm not saying it doesn't work. It absolutely can. But as someone who is marrying a digital marketer who was really gung-ho about marketing her studio online from the get, it is an expensive experiment. And most individual studio owners are going to get outspent by Music and Arts and Guitar Center 600 to 1. So and when I say expensive experiment, in marketing, you have to test everything that you're doing to make sure it's actually the right fit. So you have to test the post copy. You have to test the image that you're using or the video you're using. You have to test the link and what the call to action is to actually get someone there. Then there's the whole issue of does your website convert? And do you have the correct content in the correct order on your website? When we test, we run competing ads with the same image and then slightly different post copy to see which one gets more engagement. That's called A-B testing. It the entire time you're doing this, you're investing money. 
it is an expensive experiment. You are investing money just to see what works before you actually run the ad that hopefully works to get you students. It is a lot of investment. Now, the second option, like I said, is the investing time and energy. This would be working for another school, like I mentioned, where they might have a, an overhead or a cut that they're taking. Usually that's between 40 and 60% that they're going to take out. Um, Guitar Center, for example, if they're charging $60 an hour, they're going to pay you 20 The rest that they pocket. <laughs> now, yeah. they have a lot of overhead. They've got big buildings. Like, yeah, I get it. Right. And they're running all that marketing. But um, th that is that is their business plan. That's how it works. The other thing that we could do is look at some of these online platforms that are out there. Um, and there's a million of these now after the pandemic last year. Holy cow. There, It's outschool.com, takelessons.com, lesson face. Um, you, Craigslist and Kijiji, you can list on two. Thumbtack is a really popular one. But again, they're going to either take a cut out of all of your lessons. Those average closer to 30%. You're completely reliant on their marketing and the students that are on their platform. And then the third thing is that you're competing with all these other teachers on those platforms and they're undercutting you because what you want to charge for your lessons versus what the, you know, the stay at home mom down the street who just wants to teach piano because it's fun and she can do it out of her living room on the side. Those are going to be very, very different rates and neither is right or wrong. But when you put them on the same platform and put them next to each other, people are going to go deal hunt and they're not going to choose you. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and then the third thing, if you want to give up and go home every day, <laughs> would be social media. And by far, the least of the three evils, I, I, I'm not I'm not saying that social media doesn't work. It absolutely can. It is something that I do invest time into, you know, in building studios. But you have to have a consistent strategy. And the biggest issue with the social media is that most of us post once in a blue moon, and then we wonder why it's not working. Or we go on this really big kick for, like, a week, and then we don't post for a month again. Yep. <laughs> and we're not we're not – sure why it's not working, but it has to be consistent. Otherwise the algorithm just swallows you whole. Mm -hmm. So the flip side to all of that would be the well, and this would be mutually beneficial relationships with key people in your community. You already kind of hit on this. This is band directors, music teachers. Um, this doesn't have to just be in the schools though. This can be local youth orchestras or other ensemble programs. This could be Girl Scouts and Boy Scout troops. This could be other youth organizations like religious youth organizations, for example. This could also be homeschool networks and co-ops, depending on what timing you're looking for in the day, too. If you want to teach in the daytime, that's a great place to invest your time. But the mistake most of us made, and I'm, I'm sorry, Sam, to pick on you, and this is kind of what happened oh, in your case. Please do, yeah. <laughs> when we send out these emails and these mass emails, our response rate is about 1%. On all those emails we sent. Now yours, because you have a significant prestigious connection in your area, will be a little bit higher. You might get five to ten percent right out the gate, which is great. Most teachers are looking at a one percent response rate on those emails, and mm -hmm. it's because, like I mentioned earlier, you're one of hundreds they get in a semester. Right. Why should they answer you instead of everyone else? They probably have a friend they're already referring to for that instrument, and they don't know you, they don't trust you, and they're not going to hand off their students to someone that is a stranger over email. So the change here that we have to make and the shift that we have to make is leading with empathy. Instead of telling them what we want, I would like students, please give me students. We have to try to figure out what they want. I would never drive a stranger to the airport in my car because I wouldn't get anything back out of it and I really don't trust putting someone I don't know in a vehicle with me, right? So similarly, we want to cause a familiarity in that relationship. And, and a big part of that goal is going to be making sure that you're making an offer to them. Offer them a favor first before you ask for one. Don't just ask for the ride right away. Great things to offer. Let's start with the schools, for example. I will come in and guest teach for a day. Not a traditional sectional or master class, because what that does is it takes you in the clarinet section and it completely removes you from the ensemble and the rest of the class. They don't get to see your teaching. They still have to entertain the entire rest of the class for the day. And they're trying to rehearse now with an entire section missing. Mm -hmm. So it really doesn't help them that much. What does help them is if we can teach the entire class something for a period. They don't have to plan for that period. 
they also get to see you teach and watch the students interact with you. And if you can do this in more of a Socratic style and less of a lecture style where students are discussing and engaged and answering questions and everyone is participating actively, the students get a really good feel for who you are too. And they feel connected to you and they want you to come back because it was fun. So by having those opportunities, again, this can be with school, this can be other organizations, this can be, um, you know, offer a local homeschool co-op a free workshop, for example. When we do that free of charge, complimentary, let me just come and meet your students. It's way easier for us to then ask, could you send my flyer, for example, out to all the families I was in contact with today. Terrific. Um, well, yeah. Lots. I mean, incredible advice. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's really yeah. helpful, and and I think a lot of people get a lot out of that. Just just that that little section. Um, I'll so, jump in. Oh, go ahead. I, I, before I forget, your tone. Yep. No. <clears throat> this is my fault. The third thing. Go ahead. <laughs> I got I got on my soapbox. I so I'm so sorry. The okay. third thing we need is a repeatable enrollment process, and that's basically just covering everything after a student reaches out to you. We want low attrition. We want students to stay long term, so you're not filling the same slots over and over and over again. Mm -hmm marketing is best done if those students are going to stay for at least a year and a half to two years. The way that we do that is goal setting. In that initial few conversations, you need to have very clear short-term and long-term goals for students so they know exactly what they can accomplish by staying with you longer. And that's where we're going to invest our time in making sure that they, they have that relationship. And then also asking them questions, not just about goals, but get to know your students. It is a professional relationship, of course, but when they feel some kind of personal connection to you and they feel like you know them just a little bit, they're way more likely to stay long term. And that's a really important key of the business, too. Awesome. Um, so uh, before we wrap up, do you have any like uh, testimonials or like uh, previous clients or stories that you want to share that like really um, that you think is a really good example of, of what you can do for people? Mm. Sure. Thank you for asking. Um, you know, a lot of my clients that are teaching in traditional studio, and when I say traditional, I just mean all individual lessons. It's all one to two instruments, you know, piano and voice, for example, or clarinet and saxophone, where they're just teaching a, a small number of instruments. Most of those studios in the first six weeks of, of working together, they're adding about five students. After that, it's kind of like rolling down a hill. It gets easier. Mm -hmm. um, so I have multiple studios who have filled their full 20 to 25 hours in about, you know, 90 ish days. But what I would love to focus on is some people that are innovating right now in mm -hmm. the industry, because this year has just been wild for education in a good way. I, I know it's been scary and I, and I, I know not everyone sees this as a positive, but I think it's been great because it's opened the doors to so many other avenues for education. So for example, I've got a client who on the 1st of September just launched an asynchronous lesson program. So she's got her private lessons and she is fantastic. Her name is Becky Morris. Um, I'll, I'll give her a shout out because I just love what she's doing. She's got sure. such a great program going. She works primarily online, only online, but pr works primarily with students that are neurodiverse. And she's teaching them piano lessons online. She also does group classes. And then this third program is this asynchronous, which is pre-recorded material, instructional material that's provided to students. They go practice. And then instead of getting on a, a live half an hour Zoom lesson, they send a recording at their convenience to her to then receive either a video or text-based feedback in return. And then they can subscribe to doing that several times a month if they want to do it once a week. So, you know, four times a month if they want to do it six, eight. She's got different price points for that. But this is something that students are looking for right now, especially, you know, I, I would say students who are either later beginners, you know, like we're talking ages eight and up. So not not little tiny students so much, but students that are beginners on an instrument and just want a, a convenient way to get started and adult students mm -hmm. because they don't have the the time to invest a half an hour to an hour every single week at the exact same time. Most adult students ask for significant flexibility in their scheduling, which can be stressful for teachers. So by, by providing them this leeway where they get to choose <laughs> when they invest the time into recording, it makes a big difference. Um, the other advantage of the asynchronous lessons is that you can market it anywhere. It's not just your local area. So if you want to focus on those higher cost of living areas and charge more, that is completely doable. Um, Becky's business with her pre-registrations for next semester, I, I saw her the other day and she mentioned that 
her income starting January per month will be about $10,000 a month. Right now she's a little oh. over seven. Good for her. And just in revenue from this business. Wow. So she's got awesome things going. We've all been working together for a couple of months. It's exciting to see where that's going. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and, and thank you so much for joining me. I, I'm, yeah. to be honest, I'm blown away, to be honest. So <laughs> I, I just, you know, you just speak so eloquently and you clearly thought about thank this you. and you've had a lot of success. So, um, before I leave you, um, mm -hmm. uh, do you want to tell everyone sort of where you can find you, where they can find you, where the best, best place is to get in contact with you if they're interested in your, in your coachings and services? I think yeah, they would be absolutely. interested That's in that. <laughs> best place is up on my website, kellybearden.com. You can also find me on Facebook. That's totally fine. Um, I am not super active anywhere else. Pretty much everything I do is on Facebook since that's where I, I stay in touch with my clients too. But on my website, there's a little form that you can give me some more information about your studio. I'm happy to see if I can make some really specific recommendations for you and see if there's anything I can do to help to, to guys get you guys started. would love to talk to you. Great. Terrific. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. Um, it was a pleasure mm -hmm. to meet you and speak with you and learn about all the amazing things that you're doing and all the success that you've had. So thank you so much for being on the podcast. Of course. Appreciate it, Sam. Thanks again for having me. It's been fun. Absolutely. Uh, for more information about myself and the Candid Clarinetist podcast, please be sure to follow us on Instagram at the Candid Clarinetist or drop by our website at candidclarinetistpodcast.com. Once again, my name is Sam Rothstein and thanks for tuning in to the Candid Clarinetist podcast. <laughs>